Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And welcome to Mount St. Mary's Seminary and School of Theology, also known as the Athenaeum of Ohio. My name is Dr. Mary Catherine Levery, and I am the professor of music here at the seminary, as well as the director of the Sacred Music Institute, housed here at Mount St. Mary's, or MTSM, as we call it for short. It is an honor for the Sacred Music Institute to be co-sponsoring this event with the Cincinnati May Festival. And on behalf of both the May Festival and us here, I thank you for coming this evening. I'd like to welcome in a particular way the May Festival Executive Director, Stephen Sonderman, and Administrative Assistant, Edie Dreith, who are here with us this evening. So welcome, and thank you for being here. I would also like to invite all of you to attend the upcoming performances of the May Festival this week and next, and especially encourage you to attend the concert at Music Hall this Friday at 7.30 p.m. This Friday's concert will feature Bach's Magnificat, as well as the world premiere of Sir James McMillan's new piece, Timotheus, Bacchus, and Cecilia, about which he will speak to us tonight. You'll find on the cards that are on your seats that you may have seen when you arrived, a special promotional code for a 25% discount on the purchase of any May Festival tickets for this season. You can use the code ETHANAEUM when purchasing tickets online or over the phone. So that's ETHANAEUM, A-T-H-E-N-A-E-U-M. There's your 25% discount. You'll also find in the entryway to this building some small flyers with information about upcoming events for the Sacred Music Institute here at MTSM. The Institute will host a sacred music conference in July and as a new handcrafted pipe organ will be installed in our chapel over the summer, the Institute will host an organ blessing <coughs> and special concert on October 8th and a dedication recital Visit, featuring a visiting organist on November 12th. I encourage you all to take a flyer about the Sacred Music Institute so you can learn more about our upcoming events, learn about the mission of the Sacred Music Institute, and hopefully make a return visit to us sometime in the near future. And now, on to the lecture for this evening. It is my privilege to introduce to you Sir James Macmillan, who will be presenting a lecture this evening entitled, A Composer Speaks, Timotheus, Bacchus, and Cecilia, The Power of Music Celebrated in a New Work for Cincinnati. Sir James Macmillan is one of today's most successful composers and performs internationally as a conductor. His musical language is flooded with influences from his Scottish heritage, Catholic faith, social conscience, and close connection with Celtic folk music, blended with influences from Far Eastern, Scandinavian, and Eastern European music. Sir James first became internationally recognized after the extraordinary success of the Confession of Isabel Gaudi at the BBC Proms in 1990. His prolific output has since been performed and broadcast around the world. His major works include percussion concerto Veni Veni Emmanuel, which has received close to 500 performances, and Seven Last Words from the Cross, a cantata for chamber choir and strings, which was performed by the May Festival in 2019. Sir James has also composed a great deal of church music. The Athenaeum Chorale, which sings in the chapel here at the seminary, has enjoyed singing his motet settings of I Am Your Mother and Ave Mari Stella. He is a composer and conductor of great accomplishment and a man of great faith. We are deeply honored to be hosting him here tonight. Please help me welcome Sir James McMillan. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, good evening, and many thanks for coming out to hear me this evening. It's a great delight to be back here in, at the seminary and back in Cincinnati, and I must thank Mary Catherine for extending the inv invitation to speak to you this evening. Um, as Mary Catherine said, I was here in 2019 at this wonderful festival. Um, I, I conducted a, a concert in that festival in, in 2019 and then came to speak to you here at the seminary. And I'm delighted that uh, I've been invited back. Um, I've been asked to speak about the work that has been commissioned for this festival. Um, as you know, this is one of the most famous um, uh, choral festivals in the world, celebrating its 150th anniversary this year, and there are a number of commissions. And I'm very honoured that um, my piece has been commissioned for the opening concert on Friday night. And so my title, um, A Composer Speaks, Timotheus, Bacchus and Cecilia, The Power of Music Celebrated in a New Work for Cincinnati. Um, it's quite difficult to talk about a piece of music that no one knows yet. Uh, in fact, I haven't heard it myself yet. Um, obviously, I know it because I wrote it, um, but it's all up here. Uh, I haven't heard a note of it. That happens tomorrow uh, when I get to the rehearsals. The, the, the choirs and orchestra have been rehearsing, of course, uh, but I, I only got here last night and um, looking forward very, very excitedly towards the rehearsals tomorrow. But to talk about a piece of music that, in a sense, I haven't heard, uh, and no one knows yet, is quite, quite daunting. And, and therefore, I wanted, I certainly discuss the piece and, and try to explain a little bit about uh, what it is, um, the text I've used and so on, why, why I've written it the way I did. Uh, I'll give you a description of, of what to expect. But I want to extrapolate from this uh, a, a number of issues which I can maybe pursue uh, further uh, in the lecture tonight. There are some deep ambiguities in this work. When I was asked about it, um, both by the May Festival here in Cincinnati and by the British commissioners, the Halle Orchestra in, in England, um, uh, both commissioners wanted a work which, in a sense, was a celebration of the power of music. And uh, uh, certainly that, that's what the poem uh, is all about, and I'll tell you a bit about the poem in a minute. Um, there was also an indication from one of the commissioners t that it should perhaps be a secular text. I have no problem with that. I've set lots of secular texts as well as sacred texts. But there is a strange ambiguity about this text, which I'll explore. It is secular, but it also, also has this strange nod towards the search for the sacred in music and, and in life towards the end, which makes it, as I say, ambiguous and quite strange but it perhaps opens doors on some wider discussions and context that we might have about music, especially music in our own time in the 21st century, uh, um, its place in the, in the secular world, as well as its place in the ongoing search for the sacred in the arts, uh, which has deep resonances in what has happened in our world in the last hundred years or so, and um, I, I'd, I'd be very keen to try to explore some of that with you. But first of all, Timotheus, Bacchus and Cecilia it was composed last year and it's a setting of three sections of John Dryden's great poem from 1697 which was written in celebration of St. Cecilia's Day. Alexander's Feast is the name of the poem or the power of music. Although the poem was written as an ode to St. Cecilia, as you know, is the, who is the patron saint of music, most of the text is focused on two pre-Christian classical stories. The first section presents Timotheus. Who was he? He was a musician who served Alexander the Great and accompanied him in his military campaigns in Persia and elsewhere. The legend about him is that his music had a huge effect on the king, moving the great warrior from one passion to another. Dryden's poem refers to Timotheus's flying fingers, his music ascending to the heavens where it inspires joy. There are rich images of the god Jove moved by love in, quote, a dragon's fiery form and riding on radiant spires to Olympia. He then, quote, stamped an image of himself, a sovereign of the world, 
and we are to assume that stamp is Alexander the Great himself. Jove's influence on the warrior king seems to shake the spheres. The poet's purpose is to present allegories for the power of music on the human soul and on the human body. And later there are ref references to Bacchus, the god of celebration and the god of drink. But what is being described here in the poem is, is an actual historical event. It is what is being described as Alexander's attack on the Persian capital city of Persopolis. And Dryden stresses the greed of the looting soldiers who lost all control in their thievery, their slaughter, and their destruction. And Timotheus references the increased destruction that will follow the drunken debauchery as he sings, Drinking is the soldier's pleasure, rich the treasure, sweet the pleasure, sweet the pleasure after pain. And some things never change. And as we have seen in modern versions of this slaughter uh, in our world today, especially in the Ukraine. But the third and final section of the work presents St. Cecilia, the martyr and patron saint of music. And there is a distinct change in musical mood at this point. After the drama and indeed the violence of the opening two sections, there is the balm and serenity of a very different character. To quote Dryden, enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds with nature's mother wit and arts unknown before, or both divide the crown. He raised a mortal to the skies, she drew an angel down. The narrow bounds which Cecilia enlarges with her music is a reference to the ability of mere mortals to make such a divine thing as music. And where Timotheus praises the mortal, Alexander, raising his name to the allegorical heights reserved for celebrated individuals, St. Cecilia's music is so powerful that it tempts heavenly creatures, that is, angels, to descend to earth. So although this poem is of another time and dimension, and it's quite complex, I was struck by its breadth and its ambition to explore the transformative nature of music from a number of different angles. And its final suggestion that music might be a sacred thing, that might be of heavenly concerns, is an idea which will never fade, being as vital now as it was in the eras of Timotheus, Alexander, Cecilia, Dryden himself, and Handel, the composer, who also set this poem to music in 1736. So there's a lot there, ladies and gentlemen, and let me t pick up some threads and run w with it. First of all, I spend a lot of time listening to what many different kinds of people have to say about the things that I do. Uh, I find it, a lot of it fascinating and of immense help, stimulation and encouragement. Who are these people? Well, some are musicologists and critics, of course, but some of them are theologians attempting to interrogate the world of the arts, the world of the imagination, and specifically the world of music, to see if light can be shone on to deeper religious considerations. Some of them are social scientists as well, political minds who see important points of interface between the world of culture and the way that society can grow, develop, and gain from the insights of artists and musicians. Music always has had a social role. Socrates was referring to it way back in the day, and I think even Timotheus uh, um, represents some, something of that social role. And sometimes that role can intersect with religious concerns. Sometimes music and the other arts can even intersect with questions of ethics and morality, as well as aesthetics. I have a keen interest in the living world, uh, the secular, if you like, and how the sacred and the secular commingle and interact in it, and how this impacts on composers and artists, especially in our own time. This fascination allows me to reflect on and search for the role that people like me might have in societies like ours, and leads me to other questions which might be appropriate in our discussion today. For example, 
Is there a moral dimension to the act of composition? As I say, Socrates was asking that question thousands of years ago. Does the work of, of a composer ever impact on the desire to sustain civic values? I was asked these two very specific questions on a lecture tour some years ago in Russia, and they've given me great food for thought ever since. My answer to both is yes and no, and it's some days it veers towards no more than yes. But my indecision is complex. I'd like to start, if I may, with a consideration of the symphony in the modern age. Very specific, I know, bafflingly specific perhaps, but it, it might provide us with a useful launch pad. I've so far written five, and I'm asked why composers still want to write symphonies today. Haven't all the best ones been written already? Is the form and idea not redundant in the 21st century? Hasn't modernism and postmodernism moved at the cutting edge agenda away from the tried and the tested? Is it not just nostalgia and conservatism to fall back on an idea from the past? Every composer has considered the possibility of writing a symphony and the questions that will be asked of him and her. But in various 20th century symphonies, we can detect the foreboding of the times, the fear and destruction of war and political oppression. There are some works which, in retrospect, have been regarded as barometers of their era. Edward Elgar's Second Symphony was written in 1911, and some detect in it the melancholy tread of civilizational collapse. Mahler's Sixth Symphony was written a few years earlier and is known as his tragic symphony, full of loss, culminating in literal hammer blows of fate. At the very end, the music becomes truly despairing, perhaps a prophetic harbinger of the conflagration of world war. For both these composers, the symphonist extraordinaire and guiding light was, of course, Beethoven. Perhaps the crucial and central point in Beethoven's legacy for subsequent generations and centuries is his moral vision, a prophetic lesson which was to grab the imagination of composers over a century later. These more recent works that I mentioned by Elgar and Mahler and others, like their Beethovenian models, give the impression of having to be written, a compulsion even beyond the will of their creators. I'm reminded of this every time I conduct Von Williams's Fourth Symphony, for example. He saw this piece as pure music, unlike his first three. It's also more severe and angular in its language, not immediately inviting like some of the music we associate with Von Williams. It's not conventionally beautiful and seems troubled. Written in 1935, two years before Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, similarly, another work which signals the extreme anxiety and fear of the times. The Von Williams Symphony also seems to detect the coming storm in Europe. And later the composer said of it, I'm not at all sure if I like it myself now. All I know is that it's what I wanted to do at the time. Beethoven's symphonies have come to be seen as the pinnacle of artistic achievement in music. The distinguished art historian Alessandra Comini described Beethoven's music as having revelatory dimensions. The composer himself described his work as a divine art. And he regarded his symphonies as not merely products of high craftsmanship, but expressions of a moral vision, his term, a deeply rooted belief that great music can move the world. The composer saw his life and work as a mission and a vocation, as many artists have done in centuries and generations gone by. The fact that the modern and now postmodern world, with all its pessimism and scepticism, has nothing convincing to contradict this assessment of the high-minded inspiration behind Beethoven's greatness points to the unique unassailability of the composer's achievements and eternal reputation. To be an effective advocate for the importance of music and the arts in society, a composer must have some engagement with 
and comprehension of how politics work. Just think of how a young composer in mainland Europe must have viewed the world in 1945. Emerging from world war, holocaust and fascism. It must have felt as if the old world had failed and deserved to be ditched. For many composers, musical tradition became regarded as flawed, as with all European traditions it had, so they said, led to the Third Reich and mass destruction, the end of culture. And if the old bourgeois traditions and ideas had led to Hitler and Auschwitz, then those traditions and ideas deserve to be abandoned. Culture, art, music, all needed to begin again with a blank page so that this pure virgin territory could be shaped by the new generation and made better, or so it was thought. This outlook, outlook I'm sure you're aware, uh, prevailed in philosophy and politics as well as the arts. And one can understand how it gained traction, especially among young idealists. We can never forget that the Holocaust was committed by people from one of the great Western civilizations, one like ours. People who cultivated their fine artistic tastes in music and the other forms. People like us. The house at Vanze was a lovely, serene setting for a conference devoted to planning the world's greatest crime. But it was typical for the Nazis to surround themselves with beautiful scenery, classic buildings, classical music and books. Some of the most notorious Nazi concentration camps were built in beautiful locations and had such incongruous features as flower gardens, birdhouses, orchestras. I, I actually know a, a woman who played cello in the Auschwitz Orchestra. Libraries, zoos and, a, and swimming pools. Reinhard Heydrich, who chose Van Say for the conference, was an aristocratic and cultured man, an athlete and a talented musician. His Vanze conference was to meticulously plan the implementation of the final solution and destruction of six million Jews. Most of the participants at this event were educated men and several had law degrees. Many cultured men and women today talk in elevated terms of the spirituality of the arts, I do it myself, and even of the arts filling the vacuum vacated by religion in the modern world. Well, I certainly don't do that. But there are lessons from recent history which should make us wary and cautious of these directions. The German philosopher and musicologist Theodor Adorno argued that after Auschwitz it is barbaric to even attempt to write poetry. That art can never be a guarantee of empathy or morality or even civilization. The Nazis taught us that with their fine appreciation of classical music. Adorno argued that Auschwitz has demonstrated irrefutably that culture has failed. He said that it could happen in the midst of the philosophical traditions, the arts and the enlightening sciences, says more than just that these fail to take hold of and change the people. And he goes on, all culture after Auschwitz, including its urgent critique, is rubbish. This stark analysis asks what culture could possibly mean after the absolute failure of culture. And the academic Elaine Martin writes, the Shoah, a systematic mechanical annihilation of a specific group selected on the basis of alleged biological traits and perversely organized with bureaucratic efficiency, was a mockery of the very idea of culture that had survived into the 20th century. What credibility could cultural and artistic discourse possibly have, having themselves emanated from the same culture from which Auschwitz had sprung? And George Steiner wrote, We now know that a man can read Goethe or Rilke in the evening, that he can play Bach and Schubert, and go to his day's work at Auschwitz in the morning. The mass murder of millions was carried out within the framework of a society at the peak of cultural and artistic achievement. No, man, no wonder many have judged that such a society has lost its legitimacy of artistic d discourse after this culture had gone so catastrophically awry. And so 
Could Adorno be right when he argued that Auschwitz was more than just an unpleasant and nonetheless temporary glitch in an otherwise progressive culture? Auschwitz, he said, was part and parcel of modernity and progress themselves. He said, millions of innocent people have been systematically murdered. This was no superficial phenomenon. It is not to be seen as, as, as an aberration from the otherwise progressive tendencies of progress and enlightenment and supposed steady perfection of humanity. In fact, our still fashionable view that man can be perfected is the very reason our culture has been able to produce the likes of Auschwitz and will continue to do so until humanity embraces a truly radical counterontology. The fact that centuries of Enlightenment culture failed to predict and prevent the forces of fascism and eugenics is an implacable indictment of that culture. And remember that eugenics was very popular among the liberal, civilized bien pensant here in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and in Scandinavia before the Nazis got excited about it. And it's back on the agenda today in the modern world's obsession with screening out the disabled. Adorno then wrote, the idea that after this war, life could go on as normal, that culture can be resurrected, as if the resurrection of culture would not itself be its own negation, is idiotic. Millions of Jews have been murdered and this should be an interlude and not the actual catastrophe. What is this culture awaiting? Those of us with eyes to look around us might be alarmed to see that we might not need to await too long for another catastrophic answer to Adorno's question. The moral philosopher, Scottish moral philosopher, Alistair McIntyre, has suggested that it may have begun already. He suggests that the apparent failures of the Enlightenment project to provide a rational underpinning to our moral life was not just the failures of its most distinguished intellectuals, but suggests also that its values cannot be disentangled from the iron fist of so-called progressive politics. They were hand in glove from the start and evident in the revolutionary violence and terror of the French Revolution, a terror which attempted to replace God with revolutionary man, emptying the churches of the images of Jesus and his mother, and replacing them with the gods and goddesses of the future. And it didn't take long for new improved man to unleash the violence inherent in this new creed across Europe. And this was to happen time and time again in the centuries ahead. So this was the backdrop to culture at the end of World War II, and its implications continue today. It affected artists, philosophers, writers, politicians, poets, believers, and non-believers, and composers. For many in the 1940s and 50s, there was a feeling that culture had to begin again, free from the stains of all that had gone wrong. What was required was virgin territory, the blank page, the year zero. But perhaps a realistic view of history and culture since the French Revolution is what might be needed, a bracing and use useful pessimistic approach to the bogus optimisms which have given us fascism, communism, and Nazism in the 20th century might also be useful in our reappraisals of artistic modernisms too. And what would this mean for a composer? The composer, like everyone else, must take a broad, sweeping view of history, embracing the idealistic, moral, symphonic vision and aspirations of Beethoven through to the apparent failures of culture in the 20th century, where even artists and the arts themselves couldn't be trusted to do the right thing. So, so to come back to the questions I was asked in Russia a few years ago, is there a moral dimension to the act of composition? And does the work of a composer ever impact on the desire to sustain civic values? The moral dimension is one thing which can transcend era, custom, culture, and religion. But civic values are another thing altogether. What happens if the civic values go wrong? What if the civic majority are mistaken and become seduced by evil? What happens if a society loses sight of what is right and wrong? 
It takes more than moral courage for a person, an artist or not, to negotiate the opprobrium and possible persecution that attends standing up for goodness and its attendant truth and beauty. <clears throat> it's a favorite rhetorical trick these days, especially amongst the young, it has to be said, to ask, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Meaning, what would be Christ's reaction if he was here now and facing the political and ethical dilemmas of the 20th and 21st centuries? Well, I'm not going to ask such a dramatic question. I'm simply going to ask, what would Beethoven do? In the midst of the political and ethical dilemmas of the 20th and 21st centuries, what would Beethoven have done? Well, he stood on the side of the poor and oppressed when he took a preferential option for them in his prisoner's chorus and fidelio. He gave expression to the embrace of human solidarity in the presence of a loving God in his Schiller setting in the Ninth Symphony. But politics confused him. One moment he was dedicating music to Napoleon, the next he was celebrating his defeat at the hands of the British Army and Wellington at Waterloo. He was certainly a barometer of his age, but responded in strange and unexpected ways. There's an extraordinary but brief moment in Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, where the Lamb of God overcomes the terrors of contemporary war and revolution. Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Lamb of God, you who take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. In many musical settings of this mass movement, a composer will attempt to invoke solace and peace. But in the Misa Solemnis, the world breaks in. The ontology of violence, which seeks to overthrow the kingdom of heaven, the ideology of ever-improving human society, whether we want it or not, invades the sacred text, attempting to sweep the loving God aside, attempting to take control imperially and to become the new spirit of the age. And in Beethoven's tread of military drums and trumpets, the usurper is the revolutionary clamor that sought to bring the merciful Lamb of God to its knees and lead it to the slaughterhouse. A revolutionary clamor which Beethoven himself witnessed at first hand. And his voices respond anxiously, fearfully, Dona nobis pacem. But the defiance is there. The counter ontology is announced and expressed in Beethoven's transformation of the sounds of violence into the glorious mercy of God. And I want to continue this lecture with an exploration of this point, mercy. This moment in the Misa Solemnis is a signal from musical history that every time the Lamb of God is led to the next slaughterhouse, whether it be in pogrom, gulag, concentration camp, or the constant redefining of human worth and nature, there is an answer and a way of fighting back, a way of remembering who we are and that we are indeed loved in spite of everything by a merciful God. Beethoven was an extraordinary seismograph of political ethics and religion. He was inspired by resistance to despots, as well as moral ideals in human behavior. He wrote a Sigus symphony, a victory symphony, for the 16th century hero Egmont and Wellington's victory, not to mention Fidelio, which celebrates married love, freedom from slavery, and the defeat of tyrants. Tyrants can only be defeated by brave resistance and tyrants must never be flattered. So when the scales fell from his eyes, he changed his mind over the dedication of the Eroica Symphony and erased the name of Napoleon from the score when he declared himself emperor. Many talk of Beethoven's search for justice in these works, but it is tempered with a profound knowledge of divine mercy, expressed with insight and vision in his Mesa Solemnis and in his opera Fidelio. Would he have fallen silent if he had witnessed the Holocaust, according to Adorno's advice? Or might he have embraced its horror in a new mass setting? He brought a glimpse of mercy in the heart of the abyss into mass and opera. Perhaps that's how composers, poets, and the rest 
could answer Adorno now too. Why do I think this needs saying? Well, in the case of Beethoven, for example, the modern and postmodern world has been engaged in a curious attempt to decatholicize him. Even in his most religious works, like the Misa Solemnis, the spin is that it should be seen as a work of generalized spiritual feeling rather than the work of a Catholic composer responding to the mysteries of faith. In fact, it's not just with Beethoven we see this at work. From Mozart's Requiem to Elgar's Dream of Gerontius, commentators fall over themselves to write the Catholic dimension out of any serious reflection and consideration. It's all of a piece with general attempts to rewrite history, including musical history, to make cultural memory conform to the fresh, new orthodoxies of the present day. Now, would that be the same decatholicized Beethoven who wrote in his Heiligenstadt testimony, Almighty God, you look down onto my innermost soul and into my heart, and you know that it is filled with love for humanity and, desire, and a desire to do good. Or of whom his closest friend, Anton Schindler, insisted that his, quote, his entire life is proof that he was truly religious at heart. The same unreligious Beethoven who wrote to a friend, I must live by myself. I know, however, that God is, near to me, is nearer to me than others. I go without fear to him. I have constantly recognized and understood him. Or wrote to the Grand Duke Rudolf, nothing higher exists than to approach God and to extend his glory among humanity. And this may, in fact, be the answer to those two questions posed near the beginning of my lecture. Some of you might be surprised at the way this lecture has turned in the last few minutes. A composer talking about musical creativity will be expected to pursue a musicological direction, and the inclusion of both moral and civic dimensions of this may lead us to expect a sociological or political investigation too. But I am a religious believer, and I want to explore and interrogate the theological dimension of music. Many lovers of music, religious and non-religious alike, will refer to it as the most spiritual of the arts. The search for the sacred did not end with modernity in music, and if anything, it has grown and become more complex. The story of 20th and now 21st century music is of a complicated and sometimes bewildering re-engagement of composers with metaphysical, spiritual, and downright religious insights. Major modernist composers of the last 100 years were, in different ways, profoundly religious men and women. Stravinsky was as conservative in his religion as he was revolutionary in his musical imagination, with a deep love of his orthodox roots as well as the Catholicism he encountered in the West. He set the Psalms. He set the Mass. He was a man of faith. Arnold Schoenberg, that other great polar figure of early 20th century modernism, was a mystic who uh, reconverted to Judaism after he left Germany in the 1930s. His later work is infused with Jewish culture and theology, and he pondered deeply on the spiritual connections between music and silence. It's no surprise to me that the great American composer John Cage chose to study with Schoenberg. Cage found his own route to the sacred through the ideas and indeed the religions of the Far East. It's intriguing that his famous, or perhaps one might say notorious, 433, that is 4 minutes 33 seconds of silence, a profound provocation to our listening culture and sensibilities, or lack of them, was originally entitled Silent Prayer. The great French innovator and individualist Olivier Messiaen was famously Catholic, and every note of his unique contribution to music was shaped by a deep religious conviction and liturgical practice. There are, in my view, two composers in history who may be described as theologians. One is J.S. Bach, and the other is Olivier Messiaen. And Messiaen was a powerful influence on the likes of Boulez and Stockhausen, major figures of the post-war avant-garde. And therefore, Messiaen can be counted as one of the most impactful composers of modern times. His Catholicism 
far from being an impediment to this, was the major, indeed singular, factor behind it. Messiaen wrote one opera, St. Francis of Assisi. But the most important French Catholic opera of the 20th century was written by Francis Poulenc. His Dialogue of the Carmelites appeared in 1956. As the American Jesuit Mark Bosco comments, no other opera combines 20th century musical sensibilities with such profound theological themes on Catholic mysticism, martyrdom, and redemption. And there's no comfortable, airy-fairy, pick-and-mix spirituality here. It's based on a true story from the beginnings of modern revolutionary violence of 16 Carmelite nuns guillotined in the terror of the French Revolution. It was a, an act of retrospective defiance on the part of the composer against the secular terror of that time and indeed the secular orthodoxies of his own country and of the modern world. For a culture that was meant to have put these old things behind it, the dialogue of the Carmelites is probably the most successful modern opera of the last 60 years. It's not just another avenue on the search for the sacred, but a bold rebuttal of secular arrogances and certainties and a beautiful proclamation of Catholic truths. Here, as Bosco highlights, traditional Catholicism becomes intellectually compatible with all that was modern and progressive in French culture in the early part of the 20th century. Poulenc's opera is at once a Catholic story of heroism and faith and yet speaks to the modern world an opera for the post-war period of Europe in the 1950s, and one resonant with our contemporary struggle with Catholic faith and martyrdom. The list of composers in recent times radiating a high degree of religious resonance is substantial, covering a whole generation of post-Shostakovich modernists from behind the old Iron Curtain. Goretzky from Poland, Arvo Pert from Estonia, still alive, it was in his company a few years ago. Cancelli from Georgia. Silvestrov from the Ukraine, who's, who had to flee uh, last year, now lives in Germany. Schnitke, Gubaidulina, Ust Ustvolskaya, all from Russia. Again, courageous figures who stood out and against the prevailing dead hand orthodoxy of the day, state atheism. And in my country, after Benjamin Britten, have come the likes of Jonathan Harvey, John Tavener, and many others. So, ladies and gentlemen, far from being a spent force, religion has proved to be a vibrant, animating principle in modern music and continues to promise much for the future. It could even be said that any discussion of modernity's mainstream in music would be incomplete without a serious reflection on the spiritual values, belief, and practice at work in composers' minds. Perhaps, then, we are right to search for something beyond the moral and the civic to explore music's wider dimensions today. The search for the sacred, therefore, seems as strong today in music as it ever was. Perhaps that search now, as it was with Beethoven's Misa Solemnis, or in Elgar's The Dream of Gerontius, as it was with the theological rootedness of Messiaen's masterworks, as it was in Poulenc's glorious celebration of the mercy, sacrifice, and redemption at the heart of Catholic teaching as it is for any artist who stands out and against the transient fashions and banalities of the cultural bien-pensant. That search now may be the bravest, most radical and counter-cultural vision a creative person can have in what Roger Scruton describes as the attempt to resacralize the world around us. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, Pope St. John, John Paul II sent a letter to the artists of the world in 1999. He wrote, None can sense more deeply than you artists, ingenious creators of beauty that you are, something of the pathos of, with which God at the dawn of creation looked upon the work of his hands. A glimmer of that feeling has shone so often in your eyes when, like artists of every age, captivated by the hidden power of sounds and words, colors and shapes. You have admired the work of your inspiration, sensing in it some echo of the mystery of creation with which God, the sole creator of all things, has wished in some way to associate you. He then said, even beyond its typically religious expressions, true art 
has a close affinity with the world of faith, so that even in situations where culture and the church are far apart, art remains a kind of bridge to religious experience. Insofar as it seeks the beautiful, the fruit of an imagination which rises above the everyday, art is by its nature a kind of appeal to mystery. Even when they explore the darkest depths of the soul or the most unsettling aspects of evil, artists give voice in a way to the universal desire for redemption. John Paul has something to say here to all artists, those who believe and those who don't, and everyone else in between. He was a barometer of the soul, and his thoughts could resonate with different kinds of people. The aforementioned universal desire for redemption is echoed in these following words by him, which resonate with my thoughts about music, composition, and many, many other aspects of our human condition today. He said, apart from the mercy of God, there is no other source of hope for mankind. I'll repeat that because it's a substantial and powerful statement. Apart from the mercy of God, there is no other source of hope for mankind. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there is something in mercy that is rather humbling to all sides, which is why some secularists despise it as a pity that shames human nature. To say that we all need it undermines modernity's shibboleth of autonomy. To say that we all need it undermines modernity shibboleth of autonomy, the claim that I can give myself the law or meaning because my nature is perfectly intact and needs no redemptive underpinning from the sky fairy and his grace. Because real peace and understanding based on an ontology of divine love requires a recognition that we are all needy sons and daughters of Adam, needy of mercy, which is our redemptive truth, and in the end, our liberation. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's my profound hope that the mercy of God is palpable and audible when we reach the Cecilia section of my new piece that we'll hear on Friday night. Cecilia was an agent of God's divine love and mercy, and her special place in the hearts of musicians points to Dryden's poetic claim that she, and indeed the power of music, is, it, is capable of drawing angels down into our world. Thank you. We now have some time for uh, some questions. I have the mic on this side of the room. Uh, my trusty assistant, Daniel, has the microphone on the other side. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we will come to you. Okay. Sir James, thank you for giving us this lecture. Um, my question is that if the transcendental of beauty is a combination of both goodness and truth, is it possible to portray evil in art and say that it is beautiful? I cite John Paul's words uh, where in his message to the artists of the world, he said that when artists are drawn to the, um, the edge of the abyss, as they are inevitably, um, they encounter the possibility, the opportunity to redeem the abyss. By stepping into the abyss, following Christ's examples, per perhaps, perhaps artists have, the, uh, have the, an opportunity to turn what is in the abyss into something that is beautiful for God. By embracing the dirt and mire of human existence, evil as well, um, I think there's a, a, a deep and a profound uh, desire amongst artists, not just Christian artists, to make that into something which is true, good, and beautiful. So we will, we will always encounter evil in the arts. It's not to say that it's uh, a glorification of evil, although that does happen. 
Uh, we are aware of that, especially in our, in our, in our times. But even in some of the, the works I've mentioned tonight, uh, like the Dialogue of the Carmelites, where there, are, there is a, a, a bloody massacre of 16 nuns on stage, it is, it is nevertheless a work of profound mercy and goodness, where Poulenc embraces um, an, an historical evil, a political evil, if you like, um, a, a kind of recapitulation of Christ's crucifixion, and turns it into something profoundly good uh, uh, in music. And I think artists is, and Christian artists, by stepping up to the cross, uh, are engaged in that desire to um, redeem the abyss. The resurrection is, is not achieved without uh, the, the abyss of the cross. Uh, Saturday night, for the first time, I heard uh, Messiaen's uh, Quartet for the End of Time. I want to put you with my French pronunciation. <laughs> um, I wasn't familiar with it. Uh, it is um, very striking and percussive, and, and I think the setting of it, of which I was not familiar either before I heard it, of that being done in a prisoner of war camp, and probably most of the people that heard it the first time, which he said was his best audience ever, mm. were murdered. Uh, but it, um, uh, it's just an amazing piece. And of course, out of that darkness, you know, he lived into the post-war post -war world and played a, a very constructive uh, role. But mm. um, you probably have some thoughts about that piece, and I, I would just uh, enjoy anything mm. you might have to share about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, this is another example of artists stepping up into the abyss. Uh, Olivier Messon, who I cited uh, quite a lot in, in that lecture, uh, was um, arrested, um, captured by the Germans uh, in, in the early years of the war and put into a, a camp in Silesia. Um, he wrote this beautiful work which, which celebrates the, the love and the beauty and the truth of God as a, a prisoner of the Nazis. And it was first performed uh, in Stalag 18 or whatever it was in Silesia to an audience of not just his fellow prisoners, but also of his Nazi guards as well. Um, a true moment of the redemption uh, that I've been talking about, a desire for reconciliation a desire to bring peace to the world in the heart of war and destruction. Um, and as you quite rightly said, he went on to be one of the most important composers of the 20th century, um, exerting that influence and exerting that power. And that power ca came directly from his love of God. And we can't ignore that, to, to position that, to posit that at the heart of modernism, musical modernism, uh, the world of modern music. Uh, was, is a huge gift uh, from God himself uh, to our culture. Thank you for your lecture, Sir James. Um, you mentioned the uh, ambiguity of this piece, and as you were speaking, especially in the, um, the section where you were speaking of the, uh, the Nazis' reception of the arts, um, I was thinking about how Ambiguity itself almost defines music as a whole, at least due in part to music's shapeless, um, invisible, non-tangible um, form. Mm. Um, so when you stand at the uh, abyss to write a piece with you know, rich theological and objective undertones for a context that's neither of those things per se, um, how do you ensure that the eye of the beholder receives those undertones as opposed to making it their own Nazi self-affirmations? Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> um, well, um, th there's, there's, uh, there's something about music um, without words which is ambiguous. I think to get back to this term of ambigu ambiguity, when you, when you don't have words to set, when you're simply using the sounds of music itself to communicate something um, of one's own feelings, uh, and hopefully universal feelings of what it means to be a human, one is dealing with a very mysterious force indeed. And um, many lovers of music, whether they're religious or not, most of them aren't, 
to be honest. We'll, we'll say things like music is the most spiritual of the arts. And they mean something by that. They mean that there's something about music and their love of music that allows them to see beyond the here and now. Perhaps it allows them to see something of themselves beyond the sum of their parts. Uh, is that spiritual? It could be. Is it intellectual? It is that too. Um, but there's something about that music that speaks beyond words and images um, that, that gets truly into the crevices of the soul in a way that no other art form can. And in that sense, music is an ambiguous and mysterious art form. But it's an art form which seems to have an impact not just on the individual, uh, but on the group and perhaps even on society. It is potentially a transformative force. And I think that's when people talk about the spirituality of the arts, music being, mu music being the, the most spiritual of the arts. They are um, speaking ambigu ambiguously, of course, uh, but I think they're nodding in the direction of something truly transformative. That, that, the fact that this music that they love so much changes them. It changes them in the way that they'll see the world. It changes their emotions. It speaks beyond words and music, it speaks in sound, it speaks in the organization of pitch and rhythm and um, texture in a way that no other language can. And in that sense, uh, music is indeed uh, not just a, a, a universal language, but a spiritual language. Sir James, again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you began by noting that you haven't heard your, your piece performed yet. And I don't know um, whether you use the entire range of a, of a symphony orchestra in your work or not, but could you say something about how the instrumentation might reflect the, let's say, the, the dark and the light of the compositions? Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I was given carte blanche to write for the full orchestra of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, but also um, uh, the opportunity of writing for various choirs as well. So there's the, there's the big chorus, of course, who are f fabulous. I've conducted them before. Uh, the last time I was here, I did Poulenc's Gloria with them uh, and My Seven Last Words. Uh, so they are one of three groups that are involved, choral groups. There's a children's choir. And uh, there's, a, there's a youth choir, there's some y young singers uh, singing a kind of semi-chorus part. And the orchestra is big. I've used triple woodwind. Um, um, so, yes, I, was, I felt like a, a child on Christmas morning, uh, <laughs> uh, being allowed to sort of uh, run riot uh, in, in this incredible um, reservoir of, of sonic potentials. And the... The poem, I think, presents Timotheus as, a, as, as a, a joyous figure, so I, I can use both choirs and orchestra to create that joy. We'll see if that, that works out tomorrow morning when I get to the rehearsal. Uh, Bacchus is this um, dangerous character. Um, he's sometimes celebrated in our culture because of the, 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 the sort of um, bucolic and, and, and sort of alcoholic um, side associated, but as, as Dryden rightly points out, there's a very dark side to the god Bacchus, um, um, which, which leads to a very, very dark place. So, the orchestra can be used to paint the pictures of darkness, not just physical darkness, but perhaps hu human and spiritual darkness as well. There are, there are great resources in musical history which have allowed composers to explore not just these emotions but these images uh, in sound. And I, I will try to do that. I have tried to do that in this piece as well. But then something happens when St. Cecilia uh, arrives at the end. And it's interesting that even in Dryden's secular poem, he elevates Cecilia above all else. Um, she is, of course, the patron saint of all, mu all musicians, not just the Christian ones. And there's a great affection in the heart of all musicians for St. Cecilia um, because of what she represents, this kind of allegorical figure um, of love and the love of music. And perhaps my love of music uh, in the way that I've used the orchestra and all the different choirs will manifest itself, fingers crossed, over the next few days. 
Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, my question is in regards to the Vaughn Williams piece earlier. You mentioned you used an interesting term of uh, unconventional beauty. <laughs> and that kind of made me start thinking about a question that I've been wondering for a while, kind of this dichotomy between the Biblia Pauperorum in the French cathedrals where you see the stained glass windows telling the story you know, of creation, telling the story of the Bible, but in a way that's apparent to someone with little or no education. Mm -hmm. um, and then the seemingly con opposite side of that, which is an acquired taste and uh, a, a need for a higher education and maybe a higher knowledge of music to appreciate some more minute details. Um, do you think that those are reconcilable and how would you reconcile um, and, and earlier you were speaking about music in response to um, Kevin Tran's question um, as being a universal language. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that there is this ability for everyone to be able to enter into that dialogue. Um, but at the same time, there's a need to have a knowledge or a deeper knowledge, maybe for m more difficult pieces with more dissonance or also something like chant, which doesn't appeal to the modern tempo and sensibilities. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Yes. Well, you're right. Uh, uh, whoever whoever said music is a, a universal language was right to an extent in that the the uh, the art itself is universal, but it's it's entirely localized and focused on historical moments as well. And you no, know, there was a time when Beethoven symphonies were being um, premiered to totally baffled or audiences. Um, People wondering if, if he had gone mad uh, when they heard his third symphony, even his second symphony. You should see some of the reviews for his second symphony, uh, which talks of a madness and a, a, a kind of demonic um, depth to his music. So even then, um, composers were baffling um, to an extent uh, their, their, their own audience, their contemporary audiences. But they were writing this music in the hope that the audiences would come and meet them at some point. And it may, may have meant, meant that some never actually got the chance to meet Beethoven's own genius and, and that it was only later in time um, that subsequent audiences were able to fully appreciate or absorb the, the bigger message in Beethoven. We live with that uh, possibility and, uh, you know, I, I don't second guess my audience, for example, as a composer. I, I, I know that some people will be baffled by what I write and have been. Uh, and there are others that um, can um, um, f feel as if the music is communicating immediately. There is no single entity called an audience. An audience is made up of individuals who have their own tastes and aesthetic preferences but also their own experiences. Some will know music like this, some will have heard the, words, the work of Messiaen, some will not have heard the work of Messiaen or indeed Beethoven, for example. Um, but the composer, I think, continues on this path, uh, and it's an idealistic path of hope that, that someday, and in, and in a, a myriad w range of ways, audiences will make a connection with them. I'm sometimes asked, uh, do I have an audience in mind when I write music? And to be honest, I don't. Um, and that might sound arrogant. Uh, and, and what will sound even more arrogant is that I have an ideal listener in mind, and that ideal listener is a bit like me. <laughs> uh, what, what, what do I mean by that? I mean that my ideal listener is as hungry and curious for music they have not yet heard. And that's not everyone that I meet. Um, many people know the music they, they, they love and love the music they know and that's the end of it, end of the story. And um, may, maybe I, I won't be able to sort of communicate t to people like that. But, but, and I've met many, many, many people who are hungry and curious for not just new music but music from other cultures, from other experiences that they have not yet heard. And that sense of curiosity and hunger is, is a valuable thing. It's a beautiful thing, and um, I, I live in hope that my music encounters that curiosity. I think we have time for one last question. 
Sure, James, thank you again for your talk. You've said that the arts, and in particular music, is transformative of the observer or listener. Would you also say that it is uh, necessarily transformative of the creator, or in particular the composer? And if so, do you have any, uh, any particular uh, occasions in mind where you've, you've seen this happen? Oh, that's probably the most difficult question of the evening. Um, uh, have I, have I, uh, as, as a creator of the music, have I been transformed by the experience? Um, yes, but it's not just my music that transforms me, first of all. Uh, I, I am transformed in joy when my music communicates and that I can feel a connection. Um, that, that is an unparalleled joy. Uh, when I hear it coming alive, as I will tomorrow in the hands and in the voices of, uh, of the musicians. Um, <clears throat> and you know, what, what has lived in my head in a kind of silent place um, bec emerges in full technicolor tomorrow. So th there is, a, there is a, a moment of joy that I think every composer feels. Um, I think also composers evolve over time through the experience of not just writing each piece as it comes, but having that, that each piece speak to an audience. One cannot be affected by um, the reaction of the audience, and sometimes it can be a negative reaction, especially if you read some of the reviews I've had in The Guardian, for example, you should see what they think <laughs> about me, uh, which, is, which is our equivalent of the New York Times, if you can imagine. Um, but there's sometimes an ideological dimension uh, comes into that whole perception as well. But I, I think uh, one has to fully absorb the positive responses, not just the good reviews, but actually sometimes the very quiet approaches one can receive in silence, in, in letters, emails, and sometimes whispered responses after, com after concerts or unexpected moments where you realize or you're, you're informed that your music has communicated um, in, a, in an important way with another individual. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there will be a, a light reception in the piazza. So if you leave the building and make a left and take the sidewalk down uh, to the open area with lights uh, and some food and some things to drink, uh, we would love to have you join us. Um, make sure you take your, uh, your your card with you so as to get a discount on your purchase for a ticket uh, for the concert on Friday night. Uh, and please help me in thanking Sir James one last time. Thank <laughs> you.